Please help me welcome Vin and Liesl Chung. Good evening. My name is Vin Chung. I'm a dermatologist and a co-founder of Vanguard Skin Specialists. Hi, my name's Liesl Chung. I'm the other co-founder of Vanguard Skin Specialists. May is Skin Cancer Awareness Month. And I have to admit, I had no idea that so many people would show up to listen to a lecture on skin cancer. <laughs> I know, it's amazing, isn't it? But in all seriousness, we are so glad that you're here with us. Vin and I, we live right here in Colorado Springs, Colorado, but neither of us were born here. In fact, we weren't born in this country at all. I was born in Vietnam. And for most Americans, when we hear the word Vietnam, we automatically think of the Vietnam War. And this is the last image that most Americans have of the war. And that is of a helicopter lifting off the rooftop of the U.S. Embassy. When Saigon fell in April of 1975, that was when my story began. Because right at that moment, my mother was pregnant with me. And so I was born eight months later in the rural Mekong Delta in war-torn Vietnam. My family is ethnic Chinese, and so we were a persecuted minority. Everything was taken away. All our money, all our possessions, they took away our business. We were eventually kicked out of our own home and forced to live in this little shack with no electricity or running water. My parents had eight children to feed at this time, and so it was a struggle just to keep us alive. By the time I was three years old, my parents realized that there's just no future under this new government. And so they made the desperate decision to leave the country. In 1979, in the cover of darkness, my family of 10, along with 280 other people, packed into a, to a boat, and we sailed out to sea. We left Vietnam without a destination in mind. That's what it means to be a refugee. While Vin fled his country by boat as a refugee, my family immigrated from Korea on a plane. We came in 1976, and that was only possible because about a decade earlier, Partly in response to the civil rights movement, Congress passed an act that removed restrictions on immigrants from Asia. And so we were able to come in 76 with about 30,000 other Koreans who were seeking a better life in this country. I was one years old at the time. My parents followed odd jobs all around the country. And then one day when I was seven years old, my dad got this great idea. And it was to take our family and to move us to this rural farming community in Arkansas that had 1,400 people and had never had an Asian family live there before. <laughs> My younger brother's a filmmaker, Lee Isaac Chung, and in the Oscar-nominated movie Minari, the opening scene is based on his memory of when we moved to our new home. I'll share that with you. David, look! David, wow. look at that! Look! Wheels! Wheels? There are wheels! It's like a big car! Yeah, there! Okay! Wow! Oh. Yeah. <laughs> 그러지 말고 들어와봐. 야, 우리가 약속했던 건 이게 아니잖아. 여기, 이게 밟고 여기 잡아. 내가. 아. 오케이. 오, 알았어, 알았어. 아, 오케이. Is that the house? I don't see any houses. Over there. No. Over here. 
점점 더 심해진다. It was actually worse than that. <laughs> My parents, they worked as chicken sexers. Yes, chicken sexing is a real job. It's a job where you spend all day sorting hundreds of baby chicks into male and female. This work takes place in these loud, dusty facilities. And it's a dirty job that's usually performed by immigrants because it's the highest paying job you can get when you can't speak the language and you have no transferable skills. It wasn't exactly the better life that my parents were looking for, but it was a start in our new home. My family had also sought the better life. But when you leave Vietnam by boat as refugee, it's extremely dangerous. And the estimate is that one out of two people who left by boat actually perish at sea. In this next video here, you'll see a clip from a documentary from World Vision. In that, you'll see uh, Stan Muniham, the president of World Vision, talk about the circumstances that refugees had to endure. Vision's Operation Sea Sweep here in the South China Sea. And I want to tell you a story. It's a story of extraordinary courage, of danger, of heartbreak. When Southeast Asia fell to the communists in 1975, there were thousands of families who, prizing freedom above everything else, put the most precious cargo they had, their wives and children, into frail fishing boats and set sail on these open seas for anywhere. Desperate to escape an oppressive government, people began fleeing Vietnam in numbers of up to 5,000 every month. They knew it would be a dangerous journey. There are confirmed reports of vessels being seized by pirates, the women raped, and the men thrown overboard. Most of the boats are unseaworthy and simply sink with the first storm. With little more than their dreams and a few possessions, the Chungs took to the sea, looking for a better life. The boat that we were in when we left Vietnam actually made it to the beach of Malaysia. And there we were hoping to be admitted to a refugee camp. But instead, we were not welcome. You see, by the time that our boat made it to the beach of Malaysia, thousands of Vietnamese refugees had already flooded their beach. And so we're no longer welcome. And what the Malaysians experience is what some people call compassion fatigue. The problem with fatigue is that it could lead to resentment and then outright brutality and cruelty. And so the men on our boat were actually rounded up by the Malaysian soldiers and they were beaten. My father was among the men who were brutally beaten by the Malaysian soldiers. They had used the butts of the rifles or their canes to beat the men. We were essentially in prison on this beach. We were forced to march daily on the scalding hot sand. It was summer around this time, so the temperatures were over 100 degrees hot. We slept out in the open. Some people died. We all suffered. My mother was pregnant at this time, and there she suffered a miscarriage, and she almost bled to death. But somehow, through the grace of God, she survived. Our group was eventually divided into four smaller groups. We were then placed into four small fishing boats, and then we were told that they would tow us out to sea to bring us to a refugee camp. But when they towed us out to sea, out at sea, they cut the ropes and left us to die. That was how they got rid of us from their beach. The boat that my family of 10, my immediate family of 10 was in, uh, we had uh, no working engine. There was no food. There was no water. And Days, uh, days went on by. We became dehydrated. Some people began to hallucinate. Some people, uh, became, uh, some people t uh, became blind. The children were crying, and the parents had nothing to give them to stop their cries. After several days on end, things were becoming so desperate that some of the mothers on board the boat started talking about the unthinkable. They thought about maybe drowning their children to end their suffering. No parent should ever have to be placed in that position, but that's the type of desperation that refugees often have to encounter. Now, while Malaysia and the rest of the world turn its backs on refugee families like mine, 
there were some other people who responded differently, like Stan Muniham from World Vision. And so in this next video clip, you'll hear Stan explain why he decided to respond and to help. And in this next video footage, you actually see footage of my family being picked up from the South China Sea. Around the same time they were setting sail, World Vision was working frantically to buy and register a ship that would enable them to help refugees like the Chungs. I've been investigating this problem on three continents for six months. And the thing that has distressed and disturbed me is that for the most part, the international bureaucrats and the governments of the world treat this problem as if it didn't exist and they wish it would go away. It is this indifference and cynical neglect that has brought World Vision and this ship here to the South China Sea. If the rest of the world can stand by unconcerned while thousands of people perish who might be saved, we cannot. Operation Sea Sweep was a World Vision program designed to try to save the lives of some of the people escaping from Vietnam across the South China Sea. One of the boats they encountered was the Chungs. Sardines, just literally chock a block. Oh man! Their small boat was crammed with 93 people. Among the 27 children on board was Vin Chung. There was a tough decision to be made. The concern was that by picking up the refugees, no country would allow the ship into its harbor. I know what decision you're going to make. You can make right. the same one I'd make. Okay. But I'm going to let you make it because you'll have to make all the others. All right. Take them aboard. Yeah. Don't go. Drop it. Drop it. Go. Can you believe it? There were 93 people in that fishing boat. And that's me right there in the center of the photo. This three-year-old boy looking up at this large white ship that came out of nowhere to rescue us. Over 40 years have gone by now since this took place, and I often reflect back, who are these people? And as I think about Stan Mooneyham and the World Vision crew, it struck me that they were not famous people. They were not powerful people. They weren't wealthy people. They were ordinary people who did what they could. And by now, many of them have probably passed on. But for my family, we'll never forget them. They will always be heroes in our lives. So Vin and I are here to tell the story of our heroes. And I'd like you to introduce you to one of mine. It's my maternal grandmother. She came over to this country in order to take care of my brother and me. And my brother will never forget the day that she arrived. And let me show you how he depicted that in the movie. Baby? Baby, come. あいごいごいごいくれ。あいごいっぱら。あいおちんちゃんじゃらすにかでが선물좀줄게。아이스 야한번들어보고먼저없어아 <웃음> 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 This is my family and this is my grandmother. She taught me the very useful life skill of playing cards and swearing profusely in Korean. 
Her favorite activity was to watch WWF wrestling. She loved Andre the Giant, and she would do this while drinking Mountain Dew. <laughs> and I remember when I was a little kid, I just kept thinking she does not seem like the typical grandmother. And then it wasn't until I was much older and then much later reflecting back that she wasn't the typical grandmother because she didn't have the privilege of living a typical life. When my grandmother was 20 years old, she was pregnant with my mother and her husband, my grandfather, he was a South Korean soldier in the Korean War and he was killed. And so she found herself a very young widow with an infant during wartime. And so she had to be really tough in order to survive the war and post-war Korea. Later, when my parents needed a caretaker for my brother and me, my grandmother sold everything she had in Korea and she came to this country to take care of the two of us. She never had an opportunity to learn English because she spent the rest of her days working quietly on our farm and taking care of my brother and me until she had a series of strokes and she died at the young age of 62. I remember my brother was interviewed on NPR and I choked up when I heard him say these words. He said, I guess I hope that this film would somehow capture who my grandmother was, someone who is invisible. I would hope that she would be seen. My grandmother was an invisible person and she lived this invisible life so that one day her grandchildren could be seen in this country. My father. Oh. My father was one of those invisible people in my life. Back in Vietnam, he was CEO of a very successful company. But when he came to this country, we had nothing but the clothing on our backs. We had eight children when we arrived over the years, we had three more. And so his entire career was devoted to providing for his family of 13. My father would uh, spend most of a career working on the assembly line, performing manual labor, because that's a job that he can get when you don't speak the language. And in his job, he would stand on the assembly line, putting parts together to make these air conditioning units. Now the irony of his job in this factory that made air conditioning units with, was that the factory itself was not air conditioned. <laughs> and so he would talk about how every day when he would go to his station on the assembly line, he would pause in front of the office of the white collar workers. And he would stand there looking through the glass of the window and he would see men sitting comfortably at their desks, wearing a suit, wearing a tie. On the other side of the glass, he would stand there drench in his own sweat. And he will recognize that having that type of job was beyond his reach within his lifetime. But he prayed that if he were to work hard enough and long enough, then perhaps one day his own children could work in an office as air conditioned. While Vin's father worked on an air conditioning assembly line, my father worked in chicken houses by day. But then he had a bigger dream and his dream was to create a family business, a family farm. And so during the day he would work, then he would come home and he would work on the farm and he would spend his evenings working on the farm. And yet every night after these long days, I would see him stay up at night studying and reading because he had such a love of learning. And I think that's where I got my love of learning as well from my father. My father named this farm Eden, an aspiration of the paradise that he hoped to create. And I'm so grateful to him. He's actually in the audience tonight. <laughs> I am so incredibly grateful for the sacrifices that he made. And he put down roots in this single wide trailer in order to pursue his dream and in order to support our family. And the rest of us, we dutifully did the same. Now, all of you may be thinking, wow, this Korean immigrant family and this rural community in Arkansas, they must have felt like foreigners. But on the contrary, the people in this community, they were the foreign ones. And so let me introduce you to one of them just to show you what I'm talking about. I knew we were going to be friends. 
Can I pray? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you for the ye family. <laughs> Thank you for this divine appointment. Hallelujah. 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 That's it. Amen. Yes, 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 yes. Big things. You got big things <laughs> for this family. <laughs> okay. His name was Paul in the movie. In real life, his name was Clark, and he was a little more charismatic than that. <laughs> he did tell me that God had big things in store for our family, and I believed him. So when Clark was in prison, he met Jesus and became a born-again Christian. And so then, as a testament to his faith, he used to walk around town dragging this giant cross, and that's what he did every weekend. And then when Vin and I got married, he showed up at our wedding and completely unannounced and unexpected, he stood up and he blew a ram's horn to proclaim a blessing on our marriage. <laughs> and that ram's horn worked because we've been happily married for almost 24 years. <laughs> Clark worked for many years on our farm and he ended up becoming a good friend of my dad's. So here's Clark, a Korean War veteran, a former gang member, a former prisoner, and proud cross-dragging Jesus follower who became friends with my dad, the former Korean soldier, the Korean immigrant, the man with big dreams, and the man who loved to read. One day they got into this argument about who was tougher and they decided to go out in the field and settle this with a wrestling match. And so envision Clark, Clark's over six feet tall. He was a really big man. And then my dad's about five foot six. My dad won. <laughs> and I think it earned my dad the nickname, Little Big Strong Man from Clark. What their friendship shows me is that when you start to strip away these differences, all these external differences that seem to separate you from someone, when you start to strip that away and you really get to know someone, there's actually more that draws us together as human beings than pulls us apart. Growing up in America, when you don't understand the language and you don't know the culture, it could be challenging. For my older siblings who started junior high not knowing English, it was very, very difficult. I had it a lot easier because I was able to start in preschool. I was maybe four or five, but I still showed up to class without knowing English. And I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea what the teachers were saying. And I would just go and I would just follow what the other kids were doing. And so when they sat down in a semicircle around a teacher, I did the same thing. And when the teacher would open up a book and read, I remember, looking around and the other kids are all laughing. And I remember I wanted to laugh with them, but I had no idea what they're laughing about. And so the challenge was that I always felt like I was on the outside, that I didn't belong. And I think that in preschool, the most confusing thing of all were the nursery rhymes. And to this day, I still don't understand these nursery rhymes. <laughs> they don't make any sense. The most notorious nursery rhyme is this old man. This old man, he played one, he played knick-knack on my thumb with a knick-knack patty. Patty what? What's a patty whack? Okay, so I know what a thumb is. What's a knick-knack and what's a patty whack? And what's this old man doing to my thumb with this knick-knack patty whack? And then it gets better. All of a sudden, a dog comes out of nowhere and you give it a bone. And then the old man goes rolling home. So you can imagine why it's so confusing. And so any teachers in here, please don't teach that. Please. But, you know, growing up in school, I remember that um, there were times when we would sit there and all of a sudden the kids would stand up suddenly and they'll put the hand on their chest, face towards a corner where the flag is, and they'll start reciting what I know now as the Pledge of Allegiance. But back then I had no idea. I'll see these kids recite something and I remember 
I would move my lips too, trying to fit in. But I didn't know what was going on. Same thing with the national anthem. These are rituals that you learn over time. But today, now that I have become an American, when we sing the national anthem, tears almost always come to my eyes because now I know what these words mean. But you see, growing up as a refugee kid, you don't understand the language. I found myself nodding a lot in school, not because I understood, it was just because I didn't want to look foolish or stupid. I smiled a lot, not necessarily because I was happy. It's because I just wanted to fit in. I wanted people to like me. Fear runs deep for all refugees. And it's true for my father. When we first came over and we lived in a rental house that the Lutheran church paid for, he'd tell us, don't touch anything. This isn't your house. This isn't your country. In the back of his mind, he's afraid that if we were to break something, if we were to do something wrong, that we'll get kicked out of the country, that something catastrophic could happen. And that's because something catastrophic had happened in Vietnam. That's the mindset of a refugee. And so you live your life knowing that you have no safety net. There's no margin for error. It's almost as if you're walking on this narrow path, two inches wide, terrified that something bad could happen at any moment. For an immigrant family, it's not really fear, it's the drive to succeed. One time my dad told me that because he grew up hungry after the Korean War, that as long as you have food in your stomach, you never have to be afraid. And so for my parents, they pushed us. In my family, nothing less than an A was ever acceptable. I remember one time I was in eighth grade and I was taking a high school level geometry class. I was the youngest kid in the class and I came home with a report card that had a B on it. And my parents said, you clearly don't understand the subject matter. You're going to take that class again. And so I repeated an entire year of geometry just to prove to my parents and to myself that I could make an A, and I never brought home another B. <laughs> and then when I was in middle school, I ran for student council secretary. And when I went home and I proudly announced to my mother that I won, she said, why didn't you run for president? <laughs> and I said, a popular boy was running for president. I wouldn't have won. And she told me, she said, you should always go for what you want. It's better to do that and to fail instead of being afraid. And so when I was in high school, I ran for student council president and I won, as did my brother when he was in high school too. And so my parents really encouraged my brother and me to work hard. Dating in high school was out of the question and it wouldn't have been much fun anyway because I had an 8 p.m. curfew. <laughs> And they just really encouraged us. And, you know, you may think that my parents were strict or really harsh, but you have to understand the mindset of a first-generation immigrant. First-generation immigrants made a decision to leave behind everything that they know. They left their family, their friends, their homeland, often their language as well, and they strike out in a new country. So think about the amount of courage it takes for an immigrant to make that leap, and then how hard they have to work in order to build a life there. And so my parents did not make life easy on me. They didn't coddle me. They made me fight my own battles. But in doing so, they gave me an incredible gift. And that's an immigrant mindset to go for what I want and then to work really, really hard. My father's hard work paid off. And uh, his dream came true because today all 11 of his children work in offices that are air conditioned. <laughs> Together, his 11 children have all graduated from college. We have 22 university degrees, including six masters and six doctorates. From schools, we've graduated from schools like Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Georgetown, NYU, UPenn, and other major universities. <laughs> We live across the country. We're all proud Americans now. And we serve communities of Americans. 
We work as doctors, we work as optometrists, as dentists, other healthcare professionals. We work in IT, we teach. We've all become a part of this country now. This photo here was taken during my graduation from Harvard Medical School. And while standing on the steps of Harvard, I thought it was only fitting that I let my father wear the cap and the gown and to hold the diploma that he has made possible. I worked long and hard to become a doctor, but I can only imagine how difficult it must have been for my father. Back in Vietnam, he was CEO. In this country, he never had the opportunity to hold a job that would value what goes on in his mind or what would come out of his mouth. He was isolated for most of his career whenever he was at work because he had no one to talk to. He also had an Asian face during a time and a place where Asians were not always welcome. Now, he never elaborated what went on at work, but I knew that there were times when he did not feel physically safe there. And so he always carried a baseball bat in the back of his trunk, just in case. So my father went to work as an invisible person for several decades to provide for his children so that we can have a better future. My father, more than anybody I know, believes in the American dream. But he also understood that this dream sometimes takes an entire generation to be realized. My mother also believed in the American dream, and she sacrificed to provide. My mother didn't have an opportunity to attend college, but she was so smart that she used to help me with my AP calculus homework. She remembered all of it. And then she had this dream that one day I was gonna go to Yale. I have no idea where this came from. She had never been to Yale College. And I went to this small rural high school in a community where no one had ever gone to an Ivy League school. But yet she kept telling me, Liesl, you're gonna go to Yale. So here I am, graduation day from Yale College. And to thank my mother for her faith in me and my father for his sacrifice, I put my cap on my mother's head and I handed my dad my diploma and I told them that it belonged to them as much as it did to me. And then my younger brother did the same thing when he graduated Yale three years later. So, Lisa was lucky because she grew up with only one brother. I grew up with seven. <laughs> and that's like being raised by wolves. I mean, <laughs> that's survival of the fittest in its purest form. <laughs> Actually, two of my brothers are here tonight. There's Twan and there's Isaac. The others didn't make it. <laughs> so, the, so the eight boys would share one bedroom. But in the bedroom, there are only five beds. And so if you went to bed late, you're sleeping on the floor. That's just how it was. There's no such thing as personal space. There's no such thing as personal property. We actually shared our clothing as well. And so in our bedroom, in the corner, there was a basket of socks, a basket of underwear, a pile of pants, a pile of shirts. And every morning when we got ready for school, we'll just swarm around as piles of clothing and just pull out something that would fit. If we're lucky, it'll actually fit. But needless to say, I never ever wore matching clothes growing up. But that did not prevent me from finding my true love. <laughs> you wanna tell everyone here how cool I looked when you first met me? <laughs> Ben, I actually thought you were pretty endearing in those mismatched clothes. <laughs> Vin and I, we met at a summer program called Arkansas Governor School. It took place the summer after junior year of high school. And the reason we met is because we share the same last name. My maiden name is Chung. I'm a Korean Chung, and Vin is Chung, ethnically Chinese. And so they assigned us the same mailbox, and we met by checking the mail each day. And when Vin was packing for Arkansas Governor School, I don't think there was much left in those baskets of clothes. And you can see here we are at age 17 that summer when we met. You know, when you look like this and you have no money and a girl still likes you, you know it must be true love. 
It sure was. Vin's a refugee and I'm an immigrant, but we found that we had a lot in common. And one of those things is neither of us knew very much about the opposite sex. So I, I'd never had a girlfriend before, and I was actually very shy growing up. I never talked to girls, period. They just seemed so different. <laughs> but when I met Liesl, uh, it was easy to talk to. And then maybe it was because of our background as refugees and immigrants. We talked for hours and hours. We talked about everything. We talked about philosophy. We talked about theology. We talked about life. And then we started talking about our future as well. And then one day when we're talking about our future, I was asking Lisa what her future was, and she presented to me this laser-focused life plan. <laughs> it's true. I told him that I was going to go to Yale College, I was going to major in history or political science, then I was going to go to Yale Law School, and then hopefully become a Supreme Court Justice. <laughs> when she asked me, I said, I guess I'll go to college, the local college. <laughs> And so when she found out that I just wanted the easier path, she challenged me to aim higher. No, actually, she dared me to shoot higher. She dared me to apply to college. To, I mean, she, apply, she dared me to apply to Harvard College. And you know, when you're a 17 year old boy and a girl dares you to do something, <laughs> you can't say no. And so I applied to Harvard and guess what I got in. And so that's how I ended up going to Harvard. Lisa got into Yale as she had planned, and she went to Yale. We dated throughout college, so we rode the Greyhound bus back and forth to see each other whenever we could. And then after we graduated, we got married. And the rest is history. <laughs> So you may think that Vin and I are here to talk about the hardship of immigrants and refugees. And in a way we are, because right now there are over 27 million refugees worldwide. These are people who have been forcibly pushed from their homes and their homeland. They've been pushed out because of war, conflict, and violence. And so now more than ever, it is so important for us to understand the hardship that they go through, the journey that they take, the desperation that they feel, and then how hard it is, even if they can find a place to settle, to try to make a life in a new country like this one. But I'll also say this, which is that when Vin and I reflect back on our lives, what really stands out to us is not so much the hardship, but instead it's the incredible generosity of the people that we have encountered. And then just the thousand kindnesses that we've experienced, even from perfect strangers. It's true. When my family first landed in this country, we were in the San Francisco airport. And out of the blue, a random stranger came to me and put something in my pocket. And when I showed it to my father, he pulled it out and saw that it was a hundred dollar bill. Who was this man and why did he do what he did? No one would ever know. But perhaps he was just a random stranger who saw my family and just saw that we could use this money. When we arrive at the airport in Fort Smith, Arkansas, we were greeted by the congregation of the Lutheran Church. And when we met, we were complete strangers. We couldn't speak their language. They couldn't speak our language. But what we cannot communicate through language, we're made up for in nods and smiles and hugs. Vin and I may have worked long and hard to get to where we are today, but the humbling truth is that our life has been a gift. It's a gift that's been given to us because of the sacrifice of our parents and grandparents, because of the generosity of donors, because of humanitarian organizations, churches, teachers, coaches who have just poured into our lives. And so we know that everything we have, we didn't earn it and we don't really deserve it. And there's no way that we could ever pay it back. But we could pay it forward. There's a Chinese proverb that says, life can never guarantee security. It can only guarantee opportunity. Here in America, we are living in the land of opportunity. When I was a kid growing up, I never thought that I had much, but it wasn't until we had a chance to go back to Vietnam when I realized what abundant opportunities we have here in this country. About 20 years ago, Lisa and I went back to Vietnam 
And we visited the area where my family's from, and it's where my extended family still live today. We were shocked at the conditions that we saw. We were deep in the Mekong Delta where no tourists go, and Vin had family members that were essentially living in shacks with walls plastered with newspaper, bare light bulbs hanging from electrical cords, and one of his family members even lived in a shack with a dirt floor, dirt floor no running water, no electricity. Going back to Vietnam was mind-blowing because it was like stepping into this parallel universe that could have been mine if my parents had not made the decision to leave the country. When I, we were there, I would walk the rice fields, and while I was there, it struck me that this could have been my career, that instead of using my hands to perform surgeries, I could be using my hands to farm rice. In this photo here, you will see my aunt, my uncle, some of my cousins, and they're standing next to me and Lisa there. They left with my family from that boat that sailed out of Vietnam. Together, we made it to the beach of Malaysia. Eventually, we were split apart, placed into four small boats. The boats were towed out to sea, the ropes were cut, and the boats drifted apart. The boat that my immediate family of 10 was in was picked up by World Vision. And so I, I ended up living in America. The boat that they were in drifted back to Vietnam. They sold everything to pay for the passage to leave the country. So you can imagine the abject poverty that they returned to. They had to beg for food and for shelter, and they endured the unimaginable just to survive. And to this day, they would still not talk about some of the things that they had to go through. When I share my story with people, people often tell me that I should be so proud of everything that I've accomplished and that I'm living the American dream. But while Lisa and I were in Vietnam, when we visited my extended family here, I was not swollen with pride that I'm a Harvard graduate living the American dream. Instead, what I really felt deep down was shame. I felt shame because I knew that everything I had was not anything that I could have ever earned on my own. What I have has been a gift. It's been a tremendous gift from strangers. And it's a gift that is not meant for me to hold on to myself. But instead, it's a gift that is meant for me to share with others. When I was growing up, I had attend church. And I'd often hear the pastors preach about how Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is expected. And when I hear this preach in church, I just thought Jesus was talking about somebody else. I, it wasn't talking about me. Maybe it's talking about the rich people, right, or the powerful people. I'm just this poor refugee kid who had nothing. He's not talking about me. But after visiting Vietnam, I realized with clarity that that applies to me as well. You see, I try to help people every day as a doctor. I try to be a good husband, try to do, you know, be a good neighbor. But I believe that there's so much more that I can do because I've been given so much and that this gift is meant to be shared. And I think there's this realization that gave me and Lisa just a sense of clarity and purpose in both our personal as well as our professional lives. Vin and I moved to this community in 2009, and when we did, we started a medical practice called Vanguard Skin Specialists, and we actually thought we were starting a small solo practice for Vin, and we thought we were going to remain that way indefinitely. But then we started to visit places around the world and to sponsor projects around the world. We went to places like Cambodia, where we spent time with children as young as six years old who'd been rescued out of brothels. And we walked the streets of Phnom Penh with homeless children. Then we went to Africa, and we spent time with kids who walked for hours and miles every single day to draw water. And this water wasn't even clean, but it was all they had to drink. And then we went to places like the slums of Port-au-Prince, Haiti, where the kids don't have access to water, sanitation, hygiene, basic medical care. And in all of these experiences, it just solidified to us that our practice mission needs to be to take great care of patients, but also to make an impact in our community and in our world. 
And what we found over time is that there are other people who share this mission. And so over time, more people have joined us. And together, we've committed to make this world a place where children can have access to clean water, to medical care, and a life that's free from abuse. But I'll say this, nothing that we have done is particularly heroic, nothing. Instead, it's been one small step at a time to try to figure out how can we become one of those invisible people who can make a contribution in the lives of people who are otherwise unseen. Liesl was an immigrant, I was a refugee, but in many ways, aren't all of us immigrants and refugees? We were all born in a time and a place that we did not choose. We were born without language, without skills, without money, without power. And at some point in our lives, we were dependent on others for our survival. We're strangers in a strange land. And as we find our way in this world, we must help others to do the same. This photo here is perhaps one of my favorite photos. It was taken right after my family was picked up from the South China Sea and brought on board the World Vision ship. In it, you see my mother surrounded by her children. I'm the little boy next to her, refusing to put on a shirt. <laughs> right at the moment when this photo was taken, my family was homeless. Not only that, we did not even have a country that would allow us to sit on their street corner as homeless people. But if you look at this photo, you'll see that my mother's happy because we had just been, because we were together and we were safe and we had been given just enough to have, to have hope for a better future. And that's what Lisa and I want for all mothers and all children and all families around the world. We want them to have enough so they can have hope for a better future. The fact is that if it were not for the generosity and kindness and courage of so many people, the story of my life could have ended up anonymously at the age of three in the South China Sea. But instead, we're setting up here tonight sharing with you our story. And the impact of that generosity carries on for generations because we are here this evening with our four children, Caleb, Luke, Clara, and Timothy. Our family, we are a mix of Korean, Chinese, Vietnamese, and then our youngest adorable son there, he is a mix of Native American, Caucasian, and African American. And so all together, we're the all-American family. <laughs> And we have an all-American story. It's the story of how a father can work on an assembly line and send 11 kids to college. It's the story of a mother who never got a chance to go to college, but she dreams of the Ivy League for her children. And it's the story of a grandmother who lives an invisible life so that one day her grandchildren can tell their story, even on the Hollywood big screen. This is our story of becoming Americans. This is our story, but if you pay attention, it's not a story about us. It's a story about the heroes in our lives. It's a story about the random strangers who donated to World Vision so that my family could be picked up from the South China Sea. It's a story about the teachers who spent extra time with both of us to learn this confusing language because we couldn't speak it. It's a story about a time when we felt like outsiders, but we had coaches, we had teachers, we had Sunday school teachers who taught us that we mattered. It's a story about the sacrifices of our parents, of my father who worked with his hands for decades so that today I could use my hands to perform surgeries. 
Stan Mooneyham has passed away now, but his legacy remains. Stan never knew what happened to my family. He never knew that one day that the three-year-old boy that he picked up from the South China Sea, that one day this boy would grow up to become a doctor. He also, knew that, he ne also never knew that one day this boy would also serve on the board of World Vision and that he would stand in front of you tonight talking to you about his legacy. You see, when we look at the problems in this world, it can sometimes be so overwhelming that we don't know where to start. But Stan focused on what he could do. And he said that he accepts the fact that we could, we could do something for somebody, and so that's what he did. Stan and the World Vision crew did not have all the answers to the refugee crisis, but they did what they could. When my family was hungry, they gave us something to eat. We were thirsty, and they gave us something to drink. We were strangers, but they loved us and cared for us anyways. Lisa and I were once strangers, but we have become Americans now. And it was because of the incredible acts of ordinary people who've changed our lives forever. And so tonight, we welcome you all to join us in changing the lives of others. Thank you.